my name is Donald um, and I'm a travel and landscape photographer. I'll give you a quick uh, intro about myself and, uh, and the history. So I studied uh, at RMIT Uni with, uh, with Carly and um, we, uh, well, I uh, majored in photojournalism um, and after that I did a bit of work with newspapers, magazines, both here in Melbourne and in New York. Um, but after a couple of years of that, I kind of got a bit burnt out, just kind of trying to find work all the time. It was very unstable. And just working with people, I, I decided to have a bit of a break and uh, just get back into landscape photography. And I, I found that really relaxing and uh, meditative almost. And uh, so I, I doubled down on that. And um, yeah, a couple of years ago, we uh, moved to London, used that as a base uh, to a travel uh, and also to develop my portfolio. And that was a, an amazing opportunity. And social media has actually played a huge part in um, developing that. It's, uh, it's allowed me to work with some fantastic brands, uh, some publications and features, and just it, it gave a lot of opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to, to have, I suppose, with, without it. And um, yeah, the, the couple of years while we were traveling away was an amazing experience. I've, I've been very privileged and blessed to have traveled to uh, some incredible places in this world. There is a big gap in the middle, Africa. Um, it's, I've heard a lot about it, it's beautiful. We'll get there in, in, in due time. So what is travel photography? The great thing about travel photography is that it's, uh, it's very accessible. It's, it's for everybody. It covers um, you know, lots of major genres. Everyone likes to go on holidays. And uh, a lot of people buy a camera just to go on holidays, right? I'm sure, I mean, I, I did that when my first camera. Um, so yeah, it covers everything from street photography, uh, documentary, portraiture, of course, uh, wildlife photography, of which Africa is known for. Still life, lifestyle, and uh, of course you're probably going to have some good food while you're travelling, so you might as well take a few photos of it. But what I'm going to talk to you guys today uh, are the two genres that I specialise in, um, and that's A, landscapes, and B, cityscapes. Now some people will lump them both in the same category as landscapes, but I feel there are enough differences in shooting uh, cityscapes and landscapes to warrant uh, their, own, their own categories. Um, so where do my images come from? Like, wh where does it start? Well, it starts with, with inspiration, um, and I'm sure this is the same for all of you as well. Inspiration comes from many places. We've got traditional media, such as uh, you know, National Geographic magazine. I remember reading through that when I was a child and uh, being wowed by all the adventures these uh, you know, writers and photographers were having. Uh, to also, you know, like a TV shows get away. There's a lot of uh, traditional media where we still get inspiration from, but obviously today, most people will get it from the internet. Um, there's a lot of websites out there. I mean, Facebook, you see your friends' photos, uh, your anecdotal stories. Websites like Flickr uh, as well. As, uh, this one I use, 500px. It's pretty decent. It's got a, a high caliber of images. Lots of great photographers. But of course, the one that is hard to, uh, you know, love, whether you love it or hate it, the social media juggernaut that is Instagram. Um, I use Instagram a lot, uh, not for just networking, but also for research purposes. So. Um, in this example here, you can see there's a hashtag. So if you, if you go in somewhere, you can use hashtags to see recent images and you know, nice images of that certain location. So I was playing a trip to Neuschwanstein Castle in Germany last year in autumn. And I've put in the hashtag there, Neuschwanstein Castle. And that's, that gave me lots of recent photos that people had taken. And I used these for two, two purposes. One was to see the uh, amount of color in the leaves so I could sort of time when I could go. I was in London, so it was quite, quite close. And B, it doesn't just apply to Neuschwanstein Castle, but uh, anywhere in the world, is you can see if there's scaffolding or if there's maintenance, because um, you don't want to get to a location and just have it completely covered and you know, there, goes your, there goes your photo, I suppose. Another really great tool that I use is Google Maps, and that's become uh, definitely part of my workflow. How I use it is that uh, uh, you do your research, you find you know, good spots that you want to shoot in. You can place pins on a map that can be used on your phone. Um, and then you can also use street view. So street view is when you drop the little guy in and uh, it gives you a 360 view of what's around you. So you can always, it's almost like you're there without being there and that, that helps with, uh, with the research as well. Um, and another great thing about Google Maps is you can download the maps offline and that way when you're on the ground, you can have your phone, you've got all your pins of the places you wanna go, the map is offline, you're completely independent. You don't need to rely on Wi-Fi or, or anything like that. Um, Right, so equipment, uh, I won't go into too much detail, we can ask me more questions about this later if you like. This is sort of what I carry, I've, it's a bit of an old photo, I've ditched a few things and added a few things. The big tripod on the right's gone, I've replaced it with the orange one there, which is a lightweight aluminium tripod, which is great. Um, I'm shooting with the Nikon camera there, 
And that all kind of fits into this bag here. It's a uh, Think Tank Airport Essentials. I think you guys sell Think Tank here. They're pretty, it's a really good bag. It fits under every single airplane seat or overhead. Um, it's pretty important that you don't check in your camera gear, obvious reasons. You can get a pretty hefty insurance bill if you do. Um, but the, there's three lenses that I show you with. It's not a whole bunch of gear. Um, one is a 16 to 35 mil, so that's my ultra wide. I also have a 28 to 300 mil. So that with those two lenses alone, I've got 16 mil to 300 mil, and they're not that heavy. They're not these huge lenses that you know, a lot of people carry around. Um, and the, yeah, that covers the full gamut of focal length that I require. And there's also just a little Samyang lens there. That's a, uh, that's a 2.8 f uh, 14 mil, and that allows me to do astrophotography, like stars and stuff. And there's a drone and hard drives and other bits and pieces in there. Okay, so you've got your inspiration. You sort of know where you want to go. You've booked a holiday, or you you, you want to uh, you know plan somewhere that you want to go in particular. The first step is, if you can, choose the time of year. So some, se some photos you can only achieve uh, in a certain season. And I'll show you a few examples. So this image from uh, Bagan in Myanmar is only possible roughly between November to March. Reason being uh, the monsoon rains in uh, Myanmar stop the balloons from, from uh, running. And also you get these lovely cold morning, uh, winter mornings where you've got this separation of layers in the mist and uh, between the pagodas. Um, and this is the image I was talking to you before when I was doing research on Instagram. This is Neuschwanstein Castle. Uh, using, that, using the hashtags and you know, webcams, I was able to just pinpoint where I th when I thought the four clouds would be at their best. And uh, I was managed to come away with this image, which I, I am very proud of. Um, another one uh, based on fog and winter. This is Mount Bromo in Java, Indonesia. Once again, this shot can only be achieved in winter. Yeah, the inversion, the fog that you see there, only occurs when the cold air overnight, um, you know, it, it was cold enough to create the fog. Um, and that's, I think, June, July, if you plan to go. Uh, that's in Java, just not too far from Bali. And uh, you see the lights on the uh, mountain in the back, Mount Sumeru. Those are actually the headlamps of hikers going up for a sunrise. And of course, the Aurora Borealis, um, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Once again, it is seasonal. Um, and also very unpredictable. In this case, in the Northern Hemisphere, it only occurs between uh, mid-September to about mid-April. So if you do want to see the lights, make sure you time your uh, visit around then. Um, sorry, just give me... Okay, so sometimes you can't control the time of the year. You've got uh, restrictions with the annual leave. It's a family holiday. That's completely understandable. It's, it's kind of hard sometimes to just pack your things up and go. So if you can't control the time of the year, the next thing you can control is the time of day. Um, and we're going to go through just a few uh, different times of the day where the sun has a different quality of light and how we can use that light. Now the first one is the golden hour. Golden hour is typically uh, the time when the sun's still up, but it's kind of nice and low on the horizon. And this will be, uh, if sunset's at 8 o'clock, your golden hour will obviously be from 7 p.m. to 8, 8 p.m have a sunrise it'll be the hour that comes after uh, sunrise. In this case this is uh, an image taken in Iceland it's a place called Seljalandsfoss it's on the highway you, you can't miss it. Here we're using direct light from the golden hour you can see there's a nice uh, orange hues on the waterfall there. I think it was taken about 10 minutes uh, uh, before sunset uh, and that was about midnight give or take and in this image I've actually also used uh, what we call a neutral density filter. Uh, it's a bit of plastic, a piece of plastic or glass resin that goes over the front of the lens. It's not completely black, but it's dark enough to, uh, it basically lets less light in. So here I was able to use that filter to enable me to shoot a slower shutter speed to give me that silky effect uh, on the waterfall. Uh, once again, we're using the uh, golden hour light. This is uh, just in New South Wales. It's a place called the Great Walls of China in Mungo National Park, about six hours from here. <laughs> Um, yet in the day, normally these sand dunes are just like a nice vibrant red, still beautiful, but you've got lots of harsh sunlight. In the golden hour, as you can see it's transformed, we've got beautiful pinks, oranges in the shadows, you've got blue hues, a nice gradient over the sky. Um, but yeah, I mean the golden hour can transform a scene completely. Now you don't always have to shoot sideways at the sun, here we're shooting directly into the sun. This is the Imperial Forum in Rome. Um, and a good tip if you're shooting into the sun, is that what you want to do is you want to try and find an object, maybe like a building or a tree, and position the sun so it's just on the edge of that, 
and then you want to shoot it with a s uh, small aperture. So we're talking f11, f13, f16, f22 if you want. And what that will do is that will actually create like a sunburst. As you can see here, there's like a, a nice little flare. It's kind of it's not an annoying flare. It's a nice kind of visual, uh, a visually pleasing flare. Um, and that, yeah, so sun on the edge of uh, an object. On the other end of the spectrum, we can also shoot away from the sun, so before we're shooting into the sun. Um, this is uh, Dubrovnik, Croatia, the, uh, from the walls. It's expensive, but it's worth it, trust me. Um, so the sun's uh, shooting from the walls, sun's sort of around here, and we've got this beautiful backlight. We've got this golden, golden light on the tops of the, of the buildings and uh, some nice colour in the sky. Uh, some people will call this a reverse sunset. So when you're shooting sunset, you'll see everyone facing the sun. Sometimes it does pay to look the other way. Just uh, It's all situational. Okay, on to the next, next time of the day. This is uh, my favourite and I'm sure a lot of people's favourite as well. Uh, not so much sunrise. So sunset's at a reasonable time. The thing with sunrise and sunsets is that uh, you do need a particular set of conditions to make it work. Uh, if there's no clouds, you're not going to have a good sunset. There's nothing for the sunlight to bounce off. If you have too many clouds or there's just some cloud on the horizon, that's going to stop it from happening as well. So, um, yeah, high risk, high reward. But when it does work, the results can be absolutely amazing. This is probably one of the best sunsets I've ever seen in my life. I was just like, wow, when I was photographing it. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, Santorini in the uh, town of Ia in, in Greece. Um, and it's known as one of the best places to see sunset in the world and uh, I understood why. Um, this one is uh, in Mostar, Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's actually shot with a telephoto, so you don't actually need to use a wide angle all the, all the time. This was done with, I think, a 200 mil lens. And as you can see in the river, the water's kind of nice and soft and silky, so if you're shooting sunrise and sunset, you're probably going to need a tripod because there's going to be a lot less ambient light. Um, but the good thing about using slow shutter speeds is that uh, uh, down in the sandbank here and on the bridge, there were lots of people, so a 30 second exposure allowed those people who weren't standing still, they were walking around, to kind of be blurred and not be as prominent in this image. Um, this one's been taken in Iceland during uh, the midnight sun, that's around June, where the sun doesn't actually fully, fully set. Uh, there's these, these flowers called uh, lupin, and they're kind of everywhere all over the island in spring, and they were introduced to stop erosion, I believe. Um, but in this particular image, I used a technique called focus stacking. What that means is that if I were to just focus on the flowers right in front of me, they were like right here, the background would have been uh, slightly out of focus and vice versa. If I focused on the clouds and the flowers in the back, the flowers in front of me would have been slightly out of focus as well. So to combat that, you use a simple technique. You basically focus on the front, take a photo, focus on the back, take a photo, and then you just blend the two together in Photoshop. And that gives you uh, an image that's sharp from front to back. Focus, focus stacking. Um, <laughs> Anyone know where this is? <laughs> this, is, this is the lovely city of Melbourne. Um, it's uh, taken during sunset. And it's using a technique that I, uh, that's called time blending, which I'll go into a bit more uh, detail over. Basically, it's a, a process of locking your tripod down and taking photos through different time periods and then combining the images together to give you an effect. But uh, like I said, I'll go through that and how I sort of make that a bit later on. Um, and this is Mont Saint-Michel, I heard someone say that, uh, in Normandy, France. And it's actually a combination of both golden hour and sunrise sunset. So this is about two minutes after the sun's risen. We've got lovely golden light on the uh, abbey itself over there, but you've got like uh, the distinctive colors of a sunrise in the clouds. Right, the next one, blue hour. So this is the time that comes after sunset. So golden hour was before sunset. Blue hour is the hour that comes after. So 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, if sunset is at seven. And um, what we can use with the blue hour is use it to contrast colors. Colors is where this comes in. So here, um, We've got uh, Hallstatt in Austria. We've got lovely warm orange lighting from the village, and that's contrasted with the naturally blue um, scenery, I suppose. So the blue hour does work in particularly, uh, particularly well with when you're shooting buildings. Uh, not so much landscapes, um, but yeah, when you're shooting artificial light with natural light, you can get this really nice color play, complementary colors, orange and blue. Um, this is in Bruges, and I think you can see the, the colour play a bit more evidently there. Uh, this shot is in Dubai. Um, 
looking out over Sheikh Zayed Road. Once again, it's, a, uh, it's about 30 minutes after sunset. It's a slow shutter speed again. You can see the car trails there. They're all nice and blurred. And uh, Dubai is actually a really fun place to practice cityscape photography because there's so many opportunities around there. And um, this was taken from a rooftop, uh, specifically the level 43 bar in the Sheraton Sheikh Zayed, if you're going there. Just, uh, it does pay off to just email. Um, they'll happily let you shoot on these rooftops as long as you don't just rock up with your gear and start setting up. That's not usually a problem. But once again, yeah, orange, blue, you can see the play there between those two colours. Um, another shot nearby in uh, Abu Dhabi. This is the Sheikh Zayed Mosque. Um, and we're playing again with the artificial light. This one's not so orange. I think they're using LEDs. Uh, a lot of cities use LEDs now, so that orange-blue play isn't as evident sometimes. But uh, in this instance, I've used, before I mentioned, the neutral density filter. I've used a stronger one this time, and that's resulted in an eight-minute exposure here. Now, the reason I've done that is because the water in the front was actually quite choppy. So now it's got this really nice silky effect with an eight-minute photo. Um, and there are also lots of people walking around in the back of the mosque. So I've managed to reduce that, I suppose, with such a long exposure, because most people aren't going to be standing, standing in the same spot for, for eight minutes. And uh, this is a Trevi Fountain in Rome, another nice blue hour shot. I said this is an unreasonable hour. This is about 5.30 a.m. Sometimes you have to get up that early. I mean, travel is so uh, accessible these days that a lot of the popular spots, they're going to be flooded with tourists. I mean, I had about half an hour until I, had a, I was joined by a couple dozen people. And actually, while I was shooting here, there was a, there was a lady with her, her, her partner, I suppose. They were doing a, a shoot at the front here, and I thought, ah, oh, that'd be five minutes, won't be too much longer. And then her friend comes along and brings over like a mobile wardrobe. She had a few other dresses on there, and all of a sudden, they had a curtain up, she was getting changed, there were more photos. I was like, oh. So they ended up being there for about 40 minutes, and I was waiting. So I actually just after, I took this shot. Um, yeah, this is lucky about that just before they came because everything else after that was a, was a write-off. Right, um, so those are the uh, sunlight hours, I suppose. And another genre of photography that's really popular these days is night and astrophotography. It's becoming more and more accessible as uh, technology advances. It's like um, even mobile phones these days have a long exposure or astro mode. Even some of the, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be an expensive phone, some of the cheaper phones have that as well. And um, Okay, Astro is fun, but it does require a bit more preparation and planning. So the two most popular phenomena, I suppose, to photograph for uh, night photography would be the left Milky Way and the right was the Aurora Borealis. Um, the reason, so on the left, the Milky Way, it does require planning. As I said, there are a lot of factors that come in. It rises as a core. It, if there's a full moon, you have to check the lunar phases. If there's a full moon, it'll wipe out the Milky Way. You can sort of figure out where it's going to rise at what time. Um, for this shot uh, that was taken in uh, Chile's Atacama Desert, I used an app called Skyview Light. It's a free app. And basically what I did was, uh, after lunch, I explored the area, came over here. Um, it uses augmented reality, so AR. So you can point your phone at the sky, and you type in Milky Way, and it'll show you where the Milky Way will be at what time. And I found this composition with the road in the front, and I was able to kind of, oh, I'll come back at 8 o'clock, and then uh, lo and behold, when I came, that Milky Way was where it was uh, going to be. Um, once again, tripod, obviously required, and you need a, a fast lens. So most lenses that you get with a camera, uh, probably, when I say fast, I mean like a, allow more light in. So this was taken with a f2 lens. And on the right, you've got a, a picturesque fishing village of Hamnoi in Lofoten Islands in Nor Norway. The aurora is very fickle. Like it, we, we did an Iceland trip for 10 days. We didn't see it until day nine. And that was, it was just a little glimpse of it. You can't predict it as much, but my takeaway, if you're shooting stars or the Milky Way or the aurora, don't be afraid to use a high ISO. So that we're talking 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. Crank it up. There's no problem with that because um, more so the aurora, it's actually really fast moving. If anyone's seen it, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. It moves quite quickly. So if, you, if you're using a 30 second exposure, it's just literally just gonna be a green blob in the sky. So if you use a higher ISO, you can use a shorter shutter speed. The ideal shutter speed is between four and eight seconds probably, and that allows you to get nice definition on the aurora. And the Milky Way, the uh, max is usually 30 seconds as well. So. Don't be afraid to use a high ISO when you're shooting stars and the aurora. Um, this was a, a lucky image, uh, opportunistic. I was shooting a, a sunset in Dubrovnik. This is Lovri Yanakafu in Dubrovnik. Sunset was a fizzler. 
Um, so I, I saw some lighting in the distance and I just popped my camera down. And uh, to get this image, you can't see where the lighting is going to be. So I just set it up so it was taking 30 second photos non-stop. So I was just mashing the show, 30 seconds, next one, 30 seconds, hoping to grab a bolt. And of course, this is, this is lucky, this happened in front of me. Um, there are some specialized uh, pieces of equipment that you can use if you're really into storm photography. I think it's called the strike finder, but um, I think they take a photo when this is a lightning bolt, but for everyone else, just, just mash, the, uh, mash the shutter. <laughs> and hope for the best, I suppose. <laughs> Daylight, okay, so sometimes you can't control it. You can't, it sunsets too late or you know, uh, you, you can't get to a certain point at a certain time, you have to shoot in daylight, that's fine. There are some things you can do to get as good a result as possible, but the light is obviously never going to be as nice and pleasant as the other times that we've mentioned. This is uh, Iguazu Falls in Argentina. Um, the problem with this place for photography is that the park opens well after sunrise and closes well before sunset. And I was on a tour as well, so I had like a two hour window. So what I've used again is the neutral density filter um, that I mentioned, it's an ND1000 specifically for this one. And that's allowed me to do a nice uh, long exposure in the middle of the day, in bright sunlight. You wouldn't be able to do it without it. Um, and I think it, it works, yeah, it's, um, I'm quite happy. A little rainbow in the corner, which was a nice, a nice bonus. Uh, once again, Machu Picchu, Peru, same deal. Uh, opens well after sunrise, closes well before sunset. So sometimes you just have to make the best of it uh, and just hope for the best weather. So I was lucky that there was a gap in the clouds here and that uh, managed to scatter some beautiful sunlight over the ruins there. It's an amazing, amazing place. Definitely recommend it. Um, okay, so this is the part that uh, I'm going to go through. Um, I, I am on a bit of time restriction, so apologies if it something doesn't make sense, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or talk about it more afterwards. I was saying before, a lot of my images I use a technique called time blending. And what that means is that when you take a photo normally, you're shooting an image in one, you know, one section, uh, section of time. You've got sunrise or like a sunset and you've got the colors, but the rest might not be as nice. So what we can do, using those times of day I mentioned before, golden hour, blue hour, sunrise, sunset, daylight, whatever it is, you can actually, on a locked down tripod, so we're talking just like, don't touch your camera, set it up. If you take photos throughout a period of time, we can actually combine different elements of those times and create uh, a single image. So what I mean is this shot, from the naked eye, you can't really see this. It doesn't, ha it doesn't actually happen like this. We've got sunset, we've got beautiful colors of sunset, and then we've got the blue hour at the bottom here. So these photos are actually, I'll show you the two raw photos. So that's the original photo, just exposing for the sky. And then the second image, this is about half an hour later, maybe 40 minutes, we've got all the lights that have lit up in the city. So you can see the difference here. So what we're gonna do is we can combine both those images together because you see alone, they're not as striking. This is beautiful alone, but the, you know, the town doesn't have much detail, there's not much going on. And in here, the sky is completely blown out because I had to expose for the lights. So um, we use a process, I mean, you could do it manually, it would take you a long time. Though. You could theoretically copy that photo, paste it over here and just erase the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the town so you can get the two images together. But there's, there's a technique we use uh, called channel masking. Like I said, I'm happy to explain this a bit more later. And this is how I process a lot of my images. It saves a lot of time. So what we're gonna do, we want to try and cr to get Photoshop to do a lot of the heavy work for us. So you find a channel um, that has the most definition between the sky and the, and the land. So in this case, you can see it's quite, quite stark there. And we're gonna work it using uh, paintbrush tools, levels. We're gonna try and make it as distinct as possible so you end up with this. So this is what we call a mask. Um, and how that's gonna work is that the white bit there, that's gonna be used for the sky exposure. And the black part is going to be used for the light. Um, so in my image, I've got two layers in the bottom right corner. I've got the background layer, which is the lights. So that's sitting behind this layer. You can't see it. The lights, city lights are there. And then we've got the sky layer, which is the one you see here. And as you can see, I've actually clicked on the mask. And you can see the, uh, the perforated line where we've done that, that mask, this one before. And with the button, you click it, boom, it'll just separate the two. And then now you have a base that you can work with. There is some tweaking required. So, I mean, some of the colors here need to be tweaked. They're not, uh, not quite there, but that saves you a lot of time. 
um, and that can be a really powerful technique to get unique images um, and more so just to just to convey what you saw because when you're when you're standing there shooting a sunset you know you can see the lights coming on you can hear the birds you can see all that stuff coming on in front of you but if you just shoot one image you can't really convey that emotion so this helps so you can use as many layers as you can you can paste uh, you know another layer of the river if there's another boat there you can just use that uh, you know use this marking uh, technique and I think that's the beauty of digital photography that you can you can do this uh, it would have been quite hard in the dark room right another area that I do want to touch on um, some people hate it, some people love it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very new technology, definitely emerging, and that's obviously drone and aerial photography. Uh, the technology of these things is amazing. Like this was my old drone, it's a DJI Mavic Air, and uh, that was my phone. Like I used to just fly it and just shove it in my jacket pocket and keep going. Like it was so small, and that has a 20 megapixel sensor and shoots raw, shoots 4K video, pretty cool stuff. A bit noisy, but you know, um, I guess it's just a matter of making sure you research your, your laws uh, before you travel to a different country. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago there was a couple that were arrested in Iran for flying next to a military base. That's <laughs> probably, they should have done, I don't know, should have done the research I suppose, so they're in jail now. Um, but the beauty about drones uh, for me is that it's not going to replace my camera. I use it to supplement my, my, uh, you know, my DSLR, my regular camera, phone, whatever it can be. So an example is on the left here, we have a shot that's taken just with my uh, Nikon camera. It's just a 50 mil lens, the Nifty 50, a pretty basic piece of kit. And at the same time, that image I took on the right with my drone. So um, what it enables you to do is, uh, especially if you're working for a client or you're, do, you're doing some work for somebody, you can get double the amount of content, uh, get paid double the amount, and you also have twice as much fun. Like it's a great, great, great tool to have. I have a lot of uh, joy flying it around. But yeah, once again, if you're traveling though, you just have to make sure you look up the rules and research. So this drone shot was taken just outside of a no-fly zone, which was the national park. Um, just a couple other shots of the drone. You can get different perspectives that you normally wouldn't on the ground. So this is Old Harry Rocks in uh, the UK. Um, normally there's just a little viewing platform there. And to get this kind of shot, you know, five years ago, you would have had to pay $500,000 to get a helicopter. I think it's, uh, it's brought aerial photography into a, into a much more accessible area. Um, and this is Lake Bled in Slovenia. It's a beautiful, beautiful place without, uh, you know, without a drone, but um, I thought this was a kind of cool shot in the middle of winter. Someone said it looks like a whale at the bottom, kind of. <laughs> um, but with a drone, you don't need to have epic castles and stuff all the time. It, it can turn the mundane into something extraordinary. So this is just a creek bed um, in the middle of autumn. I just flew it over there. You, get, you can get really good perspectives um, just using a drone. And I think that's kind of the beauty of it. It gives you a new, you know, more flexibility, I suppose, when you're in, in, in an area. Roads are also a very popular uh, visual tool. You can use the roads to lead the eye around. Um, this is in Lake Bled as well. I waited some time for that car. <laughs> And you also have uh, rivers and canyons. I mean, there's lots of beautiful nature scenery in Australia. This is, uh, oh, what's the name of the canyon? Flagla Canyon in Iceland. I think Justin Bieber filmed the video clip here. But I, just called the, I just called it Justin Bieber Canyon, it's just easier. Um, but yeah, that was a drone, a drone shot as, uh, as well. Um, I think that brings me to the end uh, of my presentation. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for, uh, for coming and listening.